to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. We're missing Brian Broom today. But for those of you keeping track at home, this is the seventh commandment part of our series on the Ten Commandments. Um, So we're going to be talking about marriage, or rather, the ultimate reality that marriage reflects. And it's been something that I've been thinking about lately is how there are so many analogs in this world and in this life to the relationship between Christ and his church, the the care that God has for us, his people. Um, we see this in the repeated imagery in the Bible that the king is the husband to the nation, that the gardener is to dress and keep the land. Um, that's sort of a husbandly duty. Um, what is God telling us with all of these um <laughs> these similarities between these roles well <laughs> <laughs> we we are talking of profound things which we we have a habit of doing in this podcast we're we're constantly going back to the ontological trinity and saying asking ourselves where does this find its root in who God is in himself. Uh, It's more traditional to go back to the creator-creation distinction and say, well, God's the creator, therefore, by his sovereign power, by his sovereign authority, he ordains these things and he can do as he please. And sometimes we, we forget that God is not arbitrary. God draws from himself, he projects out of himself. He overflows with glory, joy, and goodness. And so when we we see anything in creation, what we are looking at, and use the word analog, is something that's analogical to who God is, first of all in himself, and then secondly with regard to creation. Uh, this, This is a point where it's easy to start with God in creation because God's the creator, ultimately masculine. We'll talk about what that means eventually. Creation, particularly mankind, is feminine by comparison. And we see that Christians are very familiar with the language of Christ is the husband to the church. The church is the bride, the wife, the lamb's wife. Uh, And certainly we want to talk about that. Uh, But we want to go back further and and talk about how do these things have their root in God? Is God feminine? I think we talked about this a bit a while Mm -hmm. back. So we probably should revisit that. Uh, We have to insist that everything in creation has its root in God. There's nothing that gets in from the outside. There is no outside. There's Mm -hmm. only God. But once he's made creation, then that's a new thing. And the relationship between God and his creation is not exactly the relation of the three persons of the Trinity. It's not all, in fact, because it's created and finite and he's infinite and sovereign. So we we have these two things. And um, back to the word analogy or analog, you you picked up a couple. I'm sure we could multiply them more. Oh, for sure. Bob Inc. has told us, rightly, that it is impossible to speak of God except in anthropomorphic language. Because however it is, whatever language, in words and quotes, that the persons of the Trinity use among themselves, the divine thoughts that transpire back and forth, we can't, we can't parse that. We can't understand that. God comes into and uses our language and references the creation we live in to communicate. He says, I'm a father, and we look around and we know what fathers are. He says, I'm a husband, and we look around and we see, okay, farmers, gardeners. Uh, He says, I'm a rock, I'm the sun, I'm a shield, I'm a strong tower. And when we look in the creation, we see these things. But they exist first in God. It's not that we looked around, and of course, this is the, the naive and ridiculous concept in, in um, the, the so-called science of um, the evolution of religion, uh, as if we we looked around and we saw rocks and we thought of a bigger, better rock. <laughs> uh, we looked around and saw lights and we thought of a bigger and better light. We thought looked around and saw lions and we thought of a bigger and better lion. And then uh, the marsh wiggle thrust his foot into the <laughs> fire to remind us, no, these things are real. Thank you. I was wondering if you'd pick up on that. That's a wonderful passage in Narnia that talks about this very thing. Uh, As Christians, we don't reason from the particular to the universal, although our experience runs that way. Mm -hmm. But we we confess that the original is in God, and it's eternal, and it's original, and it's universal, and it's there first. 
And God in creating the world reflects himself in thousands of ways within creation, millions and uh, infinite number of ways. But even in any given relationship, there's lots of ways that God projects himself or reveals himself in that, in that thing. Mm -hmm. So we come to marriage. God reveals himself as, as husband, as father, as provider, as caretaker, as sanctifier. But he also reveals it within himself, out of himself, the role of nourisher. He recognizes, he reveals himself in, in humility and service, faithfulness, purity. He is our father, and yet he on occasion speaks of himself as if he were our mother. Uh, and so this is all true. And, and so we are called again, as always, back to the text of Scripture, our, our basic uh, hermeneutic is governed by the Trinitarian formulations of the ancient creed because they were forged out of people who really knew the Bible and fought for it to say, this is what the Bible is saying. And they, they presented the biblical arguments and we stand on their shoulders, but we don't let ourselves get very far away from the text of scripture as we assert these things. Mm -hmm. And so, it's important to remember that whether we're looking from universal to particular or from particular to universal, any space that our logic has to be messed up will be messed up. <laughs> yes, um, we will so do that. it's it's not just working from the universals to particulars is the right way to go. It's remembering that God's revelation to us is the ultimate standard of truth. Yeah, and so even there, we're dealing with the universals of the creedal statements, but we're also doing with dealing with the particulars of the individual texts from which the church fathers came to grasp the universals. Mm -hmm. And after 2,000 years of church history, we're, we're pretty sure they were right about what they said. <laughs> you know, under the confessions, there's a little more wiggle room. But uh, we, uh, we're, this, in this podcast, we at least are saying, yeah, the, the creeds are accurate when they speak of who God is. So saying that, then, let's just take a moment and look at who the triune God is. And I, I've been writing on this for a long time, and I find myself saying the same things over and over again. And I'm sure if anybody reads what I've written enough, they're going to get really bored. It's going to seem monotonous. <laughs> it's going to say, don't you ever say anything different? No, because God hasn't told us a lot about himself as Trinity. You know, that's, this is one of those things where the questions I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven, like were there automobiles before the flood, you know, important things like that. <laughs> There's so much about the Trinity where we like to say, but did, does this mean, does this follow that, does it follow then that? But God's given us not a lot to work with. And I think we have to assume because of that, that every little piece of those, those hand, handful of truths that are interconnected, he, he's calling us to meditate on, to put them together, to fit them this way and that. And, and out of that to lay foundations for everything else. So, the risk of having repeated myself a million times, the standard creedal confession is that the Father is of none, neither created nor begotten nor proceeding. The Son is of the Father alone, neither created nor proceeding, but eternally begotten. And the Holy Spirit is of the Father and the Son, not created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in this trinity, none is before or after the other, but they are one essence with three in three distinct persons. There you go. I think by paying attention to the later Philoque clause, which, which is included in what I just said, mm -hmm. and emphasizing what the word spirit means, breath, I think we can go a little bit farther. Uh, in fact, we can go a little bit farther by what Scripture doesn't say. It's common for theologians to say, well, the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the Holy Ghost loves everybody too. Except there's not a single Scripture that says that the Holy Ghost loves the Father and Son, or that the Father and Son love the Holy Ghost. Now, that's kind of a huge blatant absence. Why should this be? And Augustine of Hippo, in wrestling with this, in his book on the Trinity, argues that the Father breathes the Spirit to the Son, the Son breathes the Spirit back to the Father, and that this is the nature of their shared love. They don't have to, the Scripture doesn't have to say the Father loves the Son, or sorry, the Father loves the Spirit, the Son loves the Spirit, because He is the very love out of their hearts, mm. 
that proceeds from the one to the other and back again. It's not that he's off on one side. It's kind of the the third wheel, the the unwelcome child in the batch, <laughs> the you know middle child is getting left out. He actually is the bond of love that connects the two. Uh, and yet it's he, not it's it. He. It's yeah. he and not it. And then we have to keep remembering that because when we think of our own love, we are definitely talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, we we are we can give ourselves to another in our actions, in our words, in our thoughts, but we cannot metaphysically interface with another person. The closest thing we come to that is the sexual act where the two become one flesh. But that's not what's going on between the father and the son. What they share is deity itself. Is they, they share themselves. They share God, living, sentient, eternal deity with one another. And so when we start talking about love of any sort, and particularly the love of a man for a woman, a woman for a man, we have to begin here. This is what love looks like. When you give of yourself out of joy and delight that you receive in, in having joy and delight in someone who's not you. You know, there's that old paradox. Well, you're just doing it because it makes you feel good. Well, no, I, I love you because you're you. Yeah, but in loving me, you get a kick out of it. So that's very selfish, don't you think? No, it's not. There is no end to the circle. <laughs> yeah, there's no. No, it's, it, 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 and it's rather stupid. It, it assumes that man has an absolute character that he doesn't have. Obviously, all of our acts are finite. And obviously, it is our nature to seek happiness. Uh, in sin, we seek it badly, in the wrong way. But we were created to be happy. Happy in God, happy in Jesus. And so we want, when we love somebody, we are happy when they love us back. And we're happy that they're happy that they love us back and happy that, they, that we love them. And none of this is a problem until you start trying to pin the universe on man and make it all spin around him. You have no end of problems. And so this, this is the nature of love. And, and, and we need to go one step further. Because now we've been talking about the ontological trinity, but that blends, that discussion blends quickly to the economic trinity, where these three came up with this incredible story what happens if there was something that's not like us, that's contrary to us, that's contrary to our love, that in fact is the, the exact opposite of our love? What would we do about that? Mm -hmm. And we now get the possibility of giving oneself in a way that is humbling and in a sense painful for the good of the other person. Mm -hmm. The father gives the son first to be the hero of the story, but then he gives him sacrificially on the cross. And for that moment in temporal history, uh, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the son, for the glory of the father, accepts this burden. He becomes sin, a sin offering, carrying, having imputed to him all of our sins. And so he too gives up this fellowship with the father in order to glorify the father and in order to save his bride that the Father has given him. And the Holy Spirit, in the middle of all of this, has to withdraw his comfort from the Son so that the Son can properly suffer, can endure alien, can experience true alienation. And so when the Son dies, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In his humanity, he feels the total absence of both the Father and the Spirit. But each is doing this for the glory of of the other, each is, is humbling himself and giving of himself and giving of what is rightfully his so as to glorify the other. The Father glorifies the Son, the Son turns around and glorifies the Father, the Holy Spirit glorifies the Son so he can glorify the Father. And there you go. And this kind of love with its faithfulness, its transparent, transparency, its honesty, its truth, this is the foundation for all kinds of love and all kinds of covenant, but particularly when we come to marriage, which is the most intimate human uh, reflection and analog, to bring it back to where we were, <laughs> of, uh, of the love that exists within the triune God. We haven't even got to talking about um, creation yet. <laughs> there we go. There's a start. So we've laid the foundation for how our understanding of love and of marriage are 
reflections of the reality of God's person, um, God's three persons. Um, how does paganism pervert this? We have seen in our generation, in a sense most literally in our generation as opposed to those that came before, this obsession with a goddess figure who is either a pangaic spirit, the, the nature personified, Mother Nature. Uh, Mother words. Nature, yeah. It, whether whether it's an abstraction or a personal spirit, we'll let its proponents argue. But it, it, the insistence is it's a female principle or female person, entity, spirit, whatever. It's female, feminine, as opposed to masculine. Because the problem with the world is masculinity. <laughs> um, the male side is the kind that trumps around in boots and smashes flowers and knocks over... China and does not care for the poor and is committed to rationality and thinking with um, the lower parts of one's anatomy and with one's muscles and uh, really just has messed up the planet, has messed up relationships, and, and really just needs to either be really tamed or needs to go away altogether so that femininity can now rule with its insistence on sentiment and intuition over logic and its uh, oneness with the planet, with all living things, uh, far superior to this idea of a God who stands outside of creation and tells us what to do. Emotion over law, intuition over revelation. And somehow if we do this, then the natural order will revert to what it's supposed to be and everybody will be happy and the age of Aquarius will arrive or something like that. <laughs> in defense of this position is the assertion that this used to be the faith of Europe, if not indeed of the whole world, that the world worshipped the goddess. And it wasn't until some Indo-Europeans and some nomadic Jews came along and began trumpeting these masculine god figures that that vanished. In fact, it vanished so, so completely that conveniently neither archaeology nor history has <laughs> any real record of this thing, but we know it had to have been there because that's how I would have written the story had I been the goddess, I guess. But alas, Western imperialism. <laughs> yeah. And, and so somewhere in the 50s or so, we begin to get these proto-feminist cults that appeal to a mythical history rooted in goddess worship. And they, they say, this, this, is, this is what happened. It was it was this this goddess worship that tried to reassert itself in the Middle Ages it was called witchcraft. It wasn't witchcraft. It wasn't satanic or demonic. It was just earth magic. It was being in friendly contact with all living creatures, and it was not used in any violent or perverse way. It was just used to bring help and healing and all that. But because people did not understand, they persecuted it. They libeled it. They drove it underground. And it wasn't until the fifties or so that finally it poked up its head and looked around and found out that. Well, maybe we got another chance. And so now it's on the move. There's a bumper sticker that probably a lot of people have said, the goddess is alive and magic is afoot. Now, the ancient Near, Near Eastern pagans did worship a goddess, right? Uh, at least one. Um, and, and it would be easy. And in fact, some Christian scholars have made the argument that all of the goddesses basically represent one goddess or faces on the same goddess or manifestations of the same goddess. And, and that may well be true. I have no arguments with that. It's, it's very clear that the gods in um, Europe, Egypt, and so on kind of flowed in and out of one another and were all expressions of some underlying magical principle or energy that, that was... Well, it's catonic, I think, is the word. Uh, the, the underground impulses that are not orderly and nice and sweet, but are constantly bubbling out and can produce various faces. And then if you go to Greek mythology, then the Olympian gods would escape that and put on permanent faces that were beautiful and often feminine. So that the gods are a little more distinct, but still there's that tug back toward all the ugliness. Uh, but it well, allowed... I was thinking of Ashtaroth. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and so... As as the ancient world looked at these goddesses, though, it said, well, we worship, oh, Aphrodite, but you've got Ashtaroth. Oh, and just across the border, there's Astarte. And over there, down in Egypt, there's Isis. And back over there, there's Ishtar. And they're all pretty much the same, don't you think? And generally, the reaction was, 
well, yeah, we can see that. <laughs> there was no real insistence by any nation over any long term that their goddess was a unique goddess and that all of their goddesses were false. It was just, this is the goddess we know. This is the goddess of this land. This is the goddess where our ancestors are buried of this state, city state. Uh, and your goddess may be some kind of similar manifestation that has a connection with you. And maybe there's something common behind them. Uh, certainly Homer tried to pull the Greek gods together and, and give us a unified roster, kind of like the Avengers and their ever <laughs> shifting roster. Yeah. Uh, but in, in all of this, and this is the other thing. So given, yes, there were goddesses and maybe you could reckon them all as one. There was always a male god too. Mm -hmm. Ashtaroth had her Baal. And if uh, Ashtaroth was the feminine side, Mother Earth and her fertility, the fertility of the land of cattle, of the female, then Baal was the masculine. He was the, the storms, the lightning, the rain that impregnated the land. He was the destructive earthquake, tempest, storm god who was the counterpart. And in order for nature to be productive, these two had to come together in a most kind of literal sense. Uh, and this would be acted out by the priests and priestesses in their magic rituals to force nature to behave and do what nature should do, be fruitful and mm -hmm. give us good stuff. But the method was always magic and it was violent magic. When I was a kid and we, and you read, um, commentaries or, or histories or archaeological books on the cult of Baal, you usually would very quickly run into a phrase that was like this. The specifics of this are too uh, perverse to describe, and we leave them unremarked upon any further. Pretty much you could rewrite that as today as, and if you want to check out late night TV or any particular Netflix um, special, you probably will find these very acts as a matter of common fare. There was a time when we didn't talk about ritual prostitution, mm -hmm. uh, homosexual prostitution, bestiality, castration, child sacrifice. We, we did not talk about these things openly because they were a distasteful, distasteful part of a past that we thought was dead. We were very wrong. We were very naive. Uh, Any time the truth pales, the darkness reasserts itself, and we're in a very dark age right now. Uh, and, and in one respect, these adherents of, of witchcraft or Wicca or the goddess religion, they're right about one thing. This is a resurgence of something very old. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're just kind of making up the details. <laughs> yeah. But what it was was not what they thought it was. It wasn't kind and sweet and nice. It was horrific. So, so this archetypal framework then sets up man and woman to be fighting. Yeah. There's always this violent conflict. Yeah. Um, yeah. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Uh, we continue to, to live in the wake of that. And the assumption within our culture seems to be that man and woman are so radically different that there can be no peace. It's one side has to surrender. And that may mean, Right now, the the worshippers of the uh, of the goddess, more often than not, I want to paint with too wide a brush, seem to think that if men just went over out, over the corner and, and went away, that women could just run the planet just fine by themselves. Maybe maybe men are necessary for breeding stock, but that's about it. And there may be ways around that one. And of course, this this is an open door for for lesbianism and the whole. Women can love each other just fine and, and raise children just fine. And men, aside from this one little biological technicality that we haven't found a way around yet, aren't, aren't really necessary. In fact, are destructive. Men are the bad guys. Masculinity is the one that's toxic, not yeah. femininity ever. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, of course, in uh, Greek philosophy, our, our favorite Greek philosophers used to say more or less the same kind of thing about women. Women are a monstrosity. They're a freak of nature. <laughs> they were supposed to be males, but something went wrong. And instead we get women, isn't it a coincidence that we can use them to reproduce? Uh, and Greek culture was full of sodomy in, in its term. We don't really need the woman, except of course, she has to produce more children. We actually kind of need her, but that's about it. And this, this back and forth between what God meant to be joined in a fruitful and joyful way continues outside of Christ 
to be a battleground, uh, both within marriage and outside of marriage, as men and women both say, I don't need no marriage. Uh, I can find sexual release and relief and, ex and excitement in other ways. But those other ways, again, are horrific. They're perverse. And we're not supposed to say that. No, it's just an alternate lifestyle. <laughs> you, just, you need to accept these people for who they are and what they are. Well, you Pat know. Benatar says love is a battlefield, so <laughs> Pat <laughs> Benatar did. says it. Must be she, true, right? Yeah, she may be onto something. Back when we were talking about love, I think this is, this is a good point to insert this here. Uh, I find that most teenagers, and probably therefore most 20 and 30-somethings, have no definition of the word love. If you push them, you'll probably get something like accept, accepting people just as they are and being nice to them. And uh, maybe uh, what is enabling them in those difficult areas of uh, personal lifestyle where the world seems to be against them. That's love. That's not what the Bible describes as love. The Bible has within the within the persons of the Godhead an elevated, beautiful, and joyful conception of what it means to give of oneself, even to death and to pain and death, to heartbreak for the good of the other person, but that good has an objective standard by which we may measure it. God, to put it in practical terms, God didn't look at fallen humanity and say, oh, guys are so scummy and disgusting. Oh, but I'll just accept you as you are. Come on to heaven and just, we'll, we'll forget all that. Uh, it wouldn't work. Uh, something that, that the world and the Christians often miss is that man in his willfulness and his sin does not want to go to heaven. Right. He does not want to be the friend of God. He does not want to hang out with God unless God completely changes all of God's own standards. If God becomes just as wicked and perverse and sinful as him, maybe, but short of that, uh, go to a place of holiness and true love and truth and purity. No, they don't want that. They just want God to go away. What they will is the death of God so that they can enjoy reality on their own terms. Uh, and all this nonsense about accepting is is exactly the opposite of love. If God is who he says he is, then we will be happy only when we conform our wills and our lives to his revelation. It, it, we will be happy and holy when we're like God, morally and ethically, when our choices reflect his, when they reflect his law. And until then, accepting people as they are is in many ways one of the quickest ways of giving them a ticket right to hell. There's one of my former students, I, just, I keep seeing this on um, LinkedIn. She was working with some young woman who has come out of the closet and acknowledged her lesbianism. And she gives kudos to my former student for encouraging her and loving her through all of this. Um, that's not helpful. If you love this young woman, then with all due love and humility and politeness, you need to explain to her that what you've come out into is rebellion against God, and it will not make you happy. It will not fulfill you. It's not who you really are, no matter what lies you've been told. Uh, you should not accept it, and therefore I cannot accept it, because God does not accept it. And I would love to show you the way back to reality, because that would be love. When someone has a fatal disease, you don't pretend that it's just a cold so that they feel accepted. Right. You have to tell them the truth. And the love that is in God is true. It's truth itself. And so when we come to marriage, it's not enough to say, well, I accept you and you make me excited. And um, I think we could have a good sexual relation together and it'd be fun hanging out with you. Let's get married as long as love lasts. <sighs> Yeah, that's not going to be very long on those terms. And the, the record of the late 20th century and early 21st century now shows us that in all the divorce statistics. Uh, that's, that's, that doesn't work. But that's what we've done to marriage, which God ordained as a place for one of the highest and best analogs of his relationship to his people. Christ comes as the bride to rescue us from our sins, to rescue us from the dragon, the monster. He comes as the bridegroom. He comes as the I'm sorry, yeah, the bridegroom. Yeah. I said, I said, yeah. And um, we're the bride. And we don't necessarily want to be rescued, but he rescues us anyway. And in giving his life, he gives us life. 
and then he comes back to life so that we can live happily ever after. And there's the archetype for all the fairy tales and all the adventure stories and all the romances. But he doesn't come and say, well, you're really scummy, but I'll take you as you are. Maybe we'll, there'll be a cheap thrill in here someplace. That's not God. It's not Jesus. And by degrading marriage, we have taken away one of the best testimonies to what the love of God actually looks like. And this is a tragic thing. It's not loving to our culture, to the people around us, to destroy our own marriages and say, yeah, but Christianity is a good thing. I didn't make marriage work so lot, but, you know. Well, and that's not to say that that some marriages shouldn't end because sometimes people are hypocritical and they don't tell the truth and they're sneaky and a man or woman gets into a marriage only to find out later that he's been lied to or she's been lied to and that bad things are happening here. Wicked things are happening here. God has set up divorce as a real possibility in dealing with very horrible sins. Mm -hmm. But you got to marry a sinner. Yep. And if we do not approach marriage on that basis with faith in Christ, with the acknowledge that we are sinners, you're, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're sinners together, our children are going to be sinners, but Jesus died for sinners. And in his love, we can find love and make love. And it can be a beautiful, though imperfect, thing. Mm -hmm. And, the, and it can be beautiful, although it's imperfect. Yeah. 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 Uh, Francis Schaeffer used, used, to word, used to use the word substantial, substantial mm -hmm. healing, substantial victory. Not perfect, not in this life but significant, real, fruitful, a fullness that the world does not know. And, and yes, that whets our appetites for eternity when sin is gone once for all. But in the meantime, this marriage thing is a good deal. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's sin and Satan and the world that look at it and try to erase it uh, as a blight on humanity. Uh, we're, we're seeing this. Uh, it, it's, it's coming out on, on into the streets. It's in our headlines. You know, there was a time when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto and pointed out that one thing that had to go was marriage mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, along with institutional religion. And uh, it, it's easy since, oh, I don't know, probably since the beginning of the 20th century, to regard Marxism mostly as an economic heresy. They have the wrong view of wealth and who should control the wealth and how that works and how politics can, in the pursuit of a utopia, economic utopia, can crush and destroy individuals. And that's all true, of course. But that was never all there was to Marxism. Marxism from the beginning uh, was a call for the complete restructuring of Western civilization by destroying institutional religion. Uh, any indeed any kind of religion that was not essentially pantheistic uh, or a religion of one's own conscious privately held, the the abolition of marriage of private property, of the state as it was then constituted of all traditions, it was the the, the goal was to wipe everything clean and start over, and as Marxism has continued, it falls back on the Hegelian dialectic of let's find two people or two groups or two cultures that are fighting and let's encourage that. Oh, look, men and women. Well, there's one we're going to have forever to work with. Let's get them fighting and out of that create some new worldview, new structure of society that will lead yet to more conflict and more conflict. And whether that it's... gives us neither male nor female, if male right. and female are fighting, they're the thesis yeah. and antithesis. And then and we come to the abol the abolishment of gender itself, sex itself which is yeah. kind of what we're seeing. <laughs> That's what we're seeing. But of course, if Hegel and Marx were right, it can't end there because gender, a genderless society has itself some kind of antithesis, which will yield a new synthesis. And I don't really want to be around to see what that's going to yeah. look like. Uh, but it, it, it is, yeah, it is frightening. But we do need to understand, first, first of all, is this conspiracy theory? Absolutely. But <laughs> you don't need no conspiracy here. This is the natural bent of the human heart. Yeah. We don't like God. We don't like anything that points to God. And therefore, we don't like marriage. We don't need some conspirators in the background saying, how can we corrupt marriage? We're going to do it ourselves. They just facilitate a little bit here and there. Um, that's, that's or they just, articulate that's, what's already naturally going on. Right. Yeah. They put, they put it in cool, smooth words and slide things around a little bit better. 
but sometimes they don't even need to do that much. As you said, it just, this is what's going on. Are you going to be part of the future or not? And, but the, uh, the thing is that every point of the way, they use the word love to justify what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is loving. This is loving to common poor people who are suffering under capitalism. This is loving to poor women who are uh, oppressed by masculinity. This is loving to children who are oppressed by the family structure and patriarchy. This is loving to free thinkers who are cowed uh, out of their beliefs by these institutionalized superstition. This is love. This is the way of the future. Come and love with us. They're stealing from Christianity, the age. Um, Brian rec- recommended the, the book Dominion, mm-hmm. and I've just started it about maybe a fifth of the way through. It's really good. I, I have some bones to pick with uh, the author's nativity when it comes to um, liberal criticisms of the Old Testament. But having said that, I'm, I'm still going to recommend it. What he is arguing is you look at the pagan world. They didn't talk about love. Uh, the Persians talked about truth, which basically meant if we're true and you're liars, we get to we get to kill you all. <laughs> the Greeks, truth was some kind of abstract idea, and you're going to follow us, or Alexander will kill you all. Or you know, truth is an expression of the God Man Caesar, and if you don't perceive it, then you're going to kill you all. Nobody <laughs> in all of this stood up and said, "I will lay down my life in the most horrible." Uh, humiliating, painful way possible to rescue those of you who hate me. It's not there until Mm -hmm. Jesus comes. And even in the Old Testament, though it's implied, it's still kind of a hush-hush mystery received by faith until Jesus comes and actually does it. And they weren't expecting it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get this idea of self-sacrificing love. God revealed himself in history in the person of Jesus Christ, who died for his bride. And now unbelievers have to steal that word, love, and that connotation, doing something wonderful, incredible, marvelous for some other person, and then fill it with their own agenda and use that to promote their their program for the 21st century. Uh, so there's, there's a lot at stake in all of this. And if, if we just fight on the periphery, we may accomplish some good here and there, particularly in, in specific lives. I'm thinking of what, what's the lady's name? The gospel comes with a uh, uh, Rosaria uh, Butterfield. Yeah, gospel comes with a house key. With a house key. You know, there you have a woman who was, and I, I haven't read it, so and I need to. I know that, but from what I have been told by my wife and others who have read it, here is a woman who was given to the gay lesbian lifestyle, and. She was touched not so much by philosophical arguments, but by the genuine love and compassion, the giving of self by an older pastor and his wife, who just welcomed her into their house and answered her questions and ate dinner with her. So we mustn't we mustn't lose track of the individual thing, but we also need to step back and see: Do we? Is part of the problem here is that we've forgotten who God is. Mm-hmm. that we've forgotten what his love is like, that we've forgotten what in the world love is. Can we even sit down? And for those of you who are listening, I, I would challenge you to turn to your spouse or your kids and say, I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Define the word love and give me a practical illustration. And if, if these people come up with, with a really good answer, go buy them Starbucks or something. <laughs> but is, is that loving? I don't know. <laughs> no, um, as a coffee <laughs> comes to <laughs> But I think what we're going to find more often than not is that people don't really know the answer. And, and, and But I've told them, yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I don't know how many things I've told to my students over and over again for four years or more if they've been in chapel at our school. And yet they, they, they come away as if they have never heard any of it because we are very sensitive to what we're hearing now. The people we hang out with, whether they're real people, whether they're Facebook friends, words. Whether or not we inst- know them. They whether, could yeah, whether be or not Instagram we... influencers or just the right. news. And yeah. more is caught than taught, right? That's the old saying. Yeah. But it's, it's not what's explicitly articulated so much as the entire climate that expresses yeah. itself in those articulations. Uh, very simply, uh, our, our imaginary friends on Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my wife and I have watched a number of series 
and we found some good things to commend in this series and that series. But some of these things that we're talking about is an ongoing subtext all the way through. Mm -hmm. Any attempt to point to, to homosexuality as as being in any way sinful or contrary to God's law is just snorted at as if no argument were necessary. It's just this is obviously, well, I'm a good Roman Catholic, but this is obviously a place where the church is behind the times. And I'm quoting a major character played by a major star in a very popular um, Netflix series. This this is constant. Who do we hang out with? Who are our even our imaginary friends? Who are the TV characters, the movie characters, the characters in novels that we we emulate, that we 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 accept as our friends, as 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 people we trust in their opinions? It makes a difference. Paul says evil communications corrupt good manners. Uh, and if we're constantly being told this kind of stuff or showed this kind of wickedness then we will we will accept it we'll buy into it and the, and the, the tragic thing is that we will then be incapable of love we'll have bought a counterfeit stuffed fluffed thing that they call love and we will have given up true tough honest love that says you need help and i'm willing to help you but there's some things we have to admit here mm -hmm. and you know if you're going to if you're going to get married that's something you got to be able to do you have to be able to say to each other i love you and therefore i'm going to tell you the truth mm -hmm. And I'm sure you'll do the same for me, probably in the same conversation. We'll both find out that we were wrong about all kinds of things. That's that's what good marriages often look like. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because again, we're sinners, but the love of God is greater than our sins. Mm -hmm. So what would be an example of a really great answer when you turn to your spouse or your kids and say, define love? What would be a great answer? Uh, love is that commitment and action that moves you to and includes, so this was more talking both about the internal motivation and the actual action, because if you split them, you lose it, mm -hmm. that allows you, leads you, enables you, moves you to give up those things that are precious and important to you, time, money, energy, your own life, for the spiritual and material welfare of another soul made in God's image. And if you, if that's not what we're talking about, then we haven't gotten to love yet. God loved the world and gave his only begotten son. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And in the father in giving the son, experienced a divine heartbreak of sacrifice, of turning his back on his son, of sending him through hell, though he was innocent. The son alienated from his father for the salvation of his bride. That's what love looks like. But in our world, it comes because we're not absolute. We're not God. In this world, our love has to be guided by what God says about love. Uh, within the Trinity, God doesn't need rules because he is the rule. He is faithful. He is true. He is transparent. He is communicative. He is eternal communion. Uh, he is humility. All of, He is beauty and joy. That, that's, that's who he is. For us, we sometimes need very specific things to be told to be told to us so that we get it, like, yeah, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. That's not loving. Mm -hmm. Well, but she makes me feel good, and I really care about it. If you really cared about her, you would not be sleeping with your neighbor's wife. Mm -hmm. it's, sometimes it comes down to things like that, because we, we've we covered it, we've covered the word love, with it makes me feel good and bubbly. I'm full of passion and excitement. Well, are you willing to give up all of that for her spiritual wealth? Are you willing to break off all communication, move out of town so that you are never tempted to seduce her away from her husband? Do you love her that much? Or if, if the answer is no, then what we're talking about is not love. It is something very, very different. So that was kind of a long answer, but in more and more <laughs> in our culture, we need that. Mm -hmm. Paul says that love is keeping the commandments of God. But that means in their fullness from the heart, in, in intent and in spirit, as well as in the bare letter. Because to keep God's commandments is to be, to act like God would act. Mm -hmm. Sometime we should have a bonus episode where we just take all of the fairy tales and all of the good stories and we throw them at you <laughs> and you tell us how they're actually reflections of the gospel. That would be fun. <laughs> I, uh, once upon a time, uh, 25 and more years ago, David Farshman and I, David, our, our good friend, was uh, 
I think we were coming back from Europe and we were making a list to kill time of all of the plot lines ever. Mm -hmm. Everything we could think of, we threw down on a piece of paper in this little notebook that we had. And then we sat back, now, how many of these are actually reflections of the gospel? Ha, ha, ha. Okay, well, that one is obviously. And of course, that one is, and that one is, and that one. Oh, wait, this one where uh, this guy sold into slavery, but he's ransomed and gets back his inheritance in the end. That, okay, that's sort of the gospel. <laughs> um, yeah, we could. It's They all are. And it's, uh, it's, it's not usually that hard to figure out. Because again, back to anthropomorphisms. Reality reflects who God is. And once we understand, this is one of the greatest apologetics for Christianity. Once you understand what the gospel really is and who God really is, and you start looking around, you start seeing God everywhere. It's just unavoidable. Like, no, not the gospel again. This was, I was supposed to be safe. This was a horror movie. Yeah, well, guess what? So, yeah, we can do that sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah. All right. Do you have any recommendations for us tonight? I recommend taking your wife out to dinner at a place that you either have always wanted to go to or haven't gone to in a long time, but really enjoyed the last time, and that you buy the entree and the, what do you call the thing comes before the entree? The appetizer. The appetizer, the entree, the uh, super salad, the extra wine or beer, depending on who your wife is. <laughs> and um, the the dessert at the Antaramisu, let me recommend that. Mm. And yes. um, just take your time, find a babysitter. Yes, it's expensive in our culture, and it's going to be hard to even find a place that's open right now. But don't let this become a once-a-year thing. Do it randomly. Do it more often than you think you can afford. There's my recommendation. But as a wife, I appreciate that recommendation. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> I know my husband is listening. <laughs> uh, he has to listen several times because he's our producer and he runs the post post production. So, show. do you have a recommendation? my recommendation? Is going to be resolving everyday conflict. Oh yeah. Uh, this is a. It's almost a pamphlet. It's a very short book. In fact, I think it's an abridged version of a longer book, um, but it's by Ken Sandy. And it's just a real good framework because every day there is conflict, especially in marriage. I feel like, I don't know, we're, we're pretty blessed that David and I see eye to eye on so many things. Like, it's kind of surprising to me how little conflict we've experienced. But that means when we do have conflict, it's pretty bad. And we need Because you're some... not experienced it at it. Right, exactly. We don't have all this practice. Um, so we've really appreciated um, meeting with our elders and pastors um, for different things and getting advice and counsel. And uh, so I recommend also meeting with your elders and pastors for counsel. Even if your marriage isn't falling apart, it's just awesome to get counsel and advice. Um, but another source would be this little book, Resolving Everyday Conflict. That's my recommendation. That's Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been Thank great. You, Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, who apparently will be taking me out to dinner at some point in the future. Uh, thank you also to you, our listeners, and our financial supporters. We really appreciate you, uh, and we hope to see you next week.